One thing I regret not doing sooner in my freelance business is connecting with other writers that I could bounce ideas off of and get mentorship from. If you're feeling like you just can't find that mentor or person you connect with, I hope that this episode helps you because it's basically a mashup of all the amazing tips that writers have shared with me this past year. I know you're going to get a lot from these insights and here's to the new year, feeling energized, enthusiastic, and confident that we can really pull off this whole freelance writing thing. There's the quote, you don't grow where you're comfortable. And the minute you're uncomfortable, that's when you're on to something. And I try to remember that because right now I'm in a discomforting season of my business. I'm in the process of starting a few new ventures and showing up a little differently and it's intimidating and it feels uncomfortable. And, you know, we like to think of that as like, oh, well, this is wrong. If it doesn't feel right, then it's wrong. And that's the farthest thing from the truth. It actually most likely means you're onto something and you just got to see it through and, you know, show up confident kind of before you feel confident. And yeah, that would be my encouragement to all, all these listeners. Like if you're in a season where you feel uncomfortable, you're in a growth phase and you're onto something. So hang in there. Explain the mango effect for all of those who do not yet follow you. Cause I was very interested when I was learning about this. The mango effect is kind of like, I guess in a nutshell, it's how I live life. And as you can see behind me, that is a mango tree. So if you don't know what a mango tree looks like, that is a mango tree. And what got me thinking when we moved here, there was something about the tree that just like really called me. And my husband and I would sit and we'd talk about it. We're like, you know, the tree, you know, it's kind of like a business, like your business, it takes forever for the tree to grow. And then, you know, you get mangoes, but sometimes they come all at once. You know, you don't always know with mangoes, you don't always know when they're going to come. Like some seasons, there's a lot of fruit. Sometimes there's not a lot of fruit, you know? So there was something about the analogy there that just really captured me. And uh, so I started applying it to business in LinkedIn and I view LinkedIn, like the mango effect is kind of how I would approach LinkedIn, how I approach life in general. It's just everything I think has like a long-term effect and you have to play the long game, like to grow a good mango tree, to grow a good, healthy mango tree. It takes time, it takes patience. You've got to give it the right nutrients. And I think that also applies to business. And I see too many people trying to like make it big out of the gates or all of these celebratory stories. Like, yeah, I got my first like six figure business in, you know, 12 months, you know, and it's like, they don't really tell you the whole story. The people that that actually happens to, a lot of them have had a bit of a ramp up before that really happened, you know? And so I feel like there's this approach to um, getting results too quickly. And I think if we just took our time, if we just were in things for the long haul, for the long game, that we would see more better and sustainable results. And so approaching life and business through that lens, is just refreshing. It's kind of fun. Like I love mangoes. It's my favorite fruit as well. So it's just like a fun way to kind of think about our businesses and our lives. What would you say the qualifications are to break into content writing and actually make this a full-time career? I just love that even the question has the word qualifications in it because a lot of the mindset stuff that's going to come up when we talk is about being qualified. So there are a million reasons I could tell you to go for it in freelance writing, but humans do tend to like three. So I, I thought of three things that after working with more than a thousand writers at this point, these are the things that tell me you're going to be okay if you go into freelance writing. The first is natural writing talent. And I'll explain a little bit more about what that means. The second is being curious about businesses and how they work. And then there's being willing to find out. And so these aren't technical things. These aren't degree related things or even graduating college related things. But these are the traits of like a human person that seems to thrive when they're freelancing. So for that first one, natural writing talent, I, I do think you can get better at writing, but the effort it, it takes to change your core personality I'm not sure that you can really do that and be happy as a freelancer if you don't already have those natural writing skills in place. So I don't think you have to be Hemingway, but I think you have to be like a toddler Hemingway who's like working on it and trying to train up. And just the idea of working with words and sentences, that that makes you happy to do that on a day-to-day -day basis. So if you don't like the building blocks of writing, uh, you probably won't like B2B writing or freelance writing. I pretty much stayed a generalist for seven years or so you know to me I was always kind of I was making it but I wasn't I wouldn't say I was really happy with my business it wasn't optimal I was still struggling I would have the feast and famine so for me it was just I was kind of nervous to niche down because I thought if I'm having trouble staying fully booked out now when I haven't excluded anybody how am I going to get more business when it's more narrow? Like I, it just didn't make sense. And people would tell me things all the time. You got to niche down. And I would just be like, I don't know. You know, I was scared. And then in 2020, I had been on LinkedIn for a long time, but I joined and I became more active and I joined more Facebook groups. I really started getting to know other writers, talking shop. And that helped me a lot to realize what was possible. I met a lot of people who were 
you know, doing better than I was and who had a lot of advice for me. And so that got me to really start thinking and to write down some goals of what I wanted to make per month, how many hours I wanted to be spending, what kind of clients I wanted to work with, you know, just getting really, really specific. I literally wrote it down and I put it all over my office. <laughs> and I'm just like, I got to get here. This is what, what I actually want. And so in looking at all of my, you know, spreadsheets, I keep track of all my jobs, how much I make, how many hours it takes, all those things. So I was just going through them kind of like, okay, so what that I'm doing would actually get me to these goals, you know? And so some of them were far off and some of them were closer. And so I just kind of analyzed that. And I realized that personal finance blogs were things that I enjoyed. They were in high demand. They were paying me the best. I had some work already. I had a whole lot of samples, like a, a published body of work. And so I said, okay, I'm, I'm going to try this. I'm going to go in here, focus on this. And so I optimized, or I changed my website, my profiles and everything to be personal finance focused. And I didn't drop all my clients right away that weren't finance, you know, I still had bills to pay and stuff. And so it was just kind of like a process of slowly, I'm going to start positioning myself this way. I'm not going to bring on any new clients who aren't in this niche. And then I'm slowly just going to kind of hopefully transition to this place where my whole work schedule is personal finance blog. And to my surprise, I just was completely mind blown at what happened once I did that. My inbox just blew up. You know, I started getting these offers to write for websites, all personal finance um, and for names that I knew, you know, and so that was pretty crazy because that hadn't happened before. It, I would get leads, but it wasn't like that. And so then I just kind of realized, wow, I was really wrong. <laughs> People want experts, you know, they're willing to pay more for experts. And especially now, you know, in the past two or three years, I feel like a, the market of freelance writers has grown. You know, there's, it's like word got out. <laughs> and so it's very saturated. And so, you know, just to be a general writer, I feel like you kind of get lost in the mix. Once you say, this is what I do. This is what I specialize in. You know, it's, it speaks to the people who need that more. I was fortunate to get that child respite stuff. So my, my mother-in-law would take the twins out for a walk and the stroller for a couple hours, and then I'd put them down for a nap. So I had a lot of time to myself and, you know, I was, I guess I don't consider myself my a super mom, but I had everything ready. Like I had all their bottles ready. I had everything washed I had every, and then nothing for me. Like I was just sitting there with really nothing to do. And I found with, there was pockets of time in my day that I wanted to do something that was not all baby stuff. I love my, my babies at the time, but that's all I was talking about. You know, the twins and their diaper schedule and their feeding schedule and their napping schedule. That's, that was the conversation. And for me, I needed more than that. I needed more stimulation, I guess. So I found just finding something, whether it could be a creative hobby, it could be gardening, it could be knitting, or it could be something business oriented. For me, it was learning about online writing, content marketing. Those are the things that really got me excited. And I found that I was a better mom because of that, because I was happy during the day. I could be present with my twins doing, going to the park and feeding them and having fun like that. And then at nap, at, when they went to nap or when they went down for the night, that I could do my things. And I found that was a really nice balance, you know, with, it also depends, you know, for, as far as the mindset, I, I would not have done freelance writing if my twins were newborns <laughs> in the first year, there would have been no way I could have done freelance writing in the, in the first 12 months. There are moms out there that are doing that. And I'm so jealous. And I'm like, wow, they are doing an amazing job, but that's something that I couldn't have done. You know, I mean, I had the twins and the first year was, I was like a zombie. So <laughs> there was no way I could really focus on something else. It was just a whole twin, my twin universe kind of thing. So, you know, as far as the mindset, it, I think it's just allowing yourself that there's more to life than being a mom. You don't have to identify yourself as a mom. You can be a mom with a business or a mom with something else. You, you know what I mean? I, I think a lot of times when you do become a mom, people just identify you as that. And for me, I didn't want that, I guess. I wanted to be more than just that. Because freelancers, specifically writers, tend to be a little bit introverted, they relish the fact that they don't have to talk to clients. But one of the biggest things I try to harp on is like, hey, have that face-to-face -face contact with your clients to build a relationship because they want to see the person face-to-face -face that they're giving thousands of dollars per month to. And in order for them to feel like they have skin in the game and they want to prolong the relationship with you, make it last longer, keep you on, they need to have some type of connection with you beyond just emailing back and forth in Google comments. 
Yes, absolutely. And one of the biggest tips I can give here is if you're working with not just solopreneurs, which if you're charging thousands of dollars a month, you probably aren't. So if you're working with bigger clients that actually have teams, get their teams on the call with you. Ask for other sellers who may not be decision makers to come in and collaborate on the edits because the last thing you want, first of all, is final sign off on copy and then they send it to their team and their team's like, whoa, what is this nonsense? This isn't what I was expecting and you have to do more edits after you thought you were done. But also, when your key contact is away, you can continue working. You have another source of feedback. If there's ever any disagreements or misunderstandings, you're not just dealing one on one with one person who can advocate for you. There are multiple people in that team who appreciate you and believe in what you're doing and like working with you. And it, it makes you a part of their culture as much as, you know, it helps client communication, which makes you honestly, I'm going to say it this way, harder to get rid of. Like you're integrated into their team. You're a part of their team and you're a fit with their culture. They know you, they like you, they trust you. Even if you just make it bi-weekly meetings, everyone can spare two hours of Zoom a month to make sure that a five or six figure client sticks it out with them over the long term. For sure. Making yourself sticky, especially as people leave roles, like there's no tomorrow. You don't, I mean, I can't say how many Facebook posts I've seen being like, my client just quit and now I'm not getting work and I was basing my whole income off them and now I'm screwed. So it's definitely good to involve multiple stakeholders. All right, so contract workflow, this kind of dovetails with contracts you need, but pretty much all freelancers are starting with a proposal, whether that's an informal proposal sent in an email. I don't know if any of you are on Fiverr or anything like that, but at some point in time, you're gonna send some sort of proposal language. That is great, but I want you to know that that has no legal protection for you whatsoever. This is basically, a proposal is basically an informal discussion between you and your client. It has none of the legal language that a contract has that's a backstop that's going to protect you, that's going to protect your payments, that's going to protect you against scope creep, which I know, unfortunately, happens to pretty much every copywriter at some point in time in their career. So if you have beautifully branded proposals, absolutely use them, but know that you always need to backstop that with a contract. So as far as when this all goes down, you're going to send the proposal whenever you're going to send the proposal. A contract needs to be signed, whether it's e-sign or I don't think anybody's hand signing contracts nowadays, but it needs to be executed before you start working because the contract has your payment language. So you don't want to start working before, e even if you're not, I should back backtrack a second. So like, let's say, I, I know most copywriters are getting paid at least a little bit upfront, whether it's a retainer, deposit, first installment payment, whatever it is, but some opt to get paid at the end of 30 days. If that's the case, you still need that contract to be signed because that contract is going to say you're going to get paid at the end of 30 days. So very important to make sure that you have sent the contract, they have signed the contract before you start working. And I know sometimes, especially if you are working as a freelancer with, say, an established corporation, they have loopholes, they have departments, things have to go through. I know that's annoying. And especially if you're just starting out, you may be chomping at the bit, you want to get started. You may have a lot of different clients that you're trying to balance and you want to get started on the work. My recommendation is never start until you have a signed contract. I was absolutely clueless. I think, you know, your overview and perspective just kind of gave me the insight that I needed to get started. It was truly just the nicest high level overview of kind of how this works and just kind of how to find the confidence in the process and just that comfort level and jumping in and getting started. I think a lot of people, especially, I mean, I can use myself as an example. Nurses don't do anything without knowing exactly what the process is. I mean, you're not going to walk into a patient room and put an IV in someone if you've never done it before and you've never done your research and you've never practiced. So, you know, for, for a lot of people, that comfort zone just isn't there because you're like, there's so many things I don't know. There's so many things I don't know. I don't even know where to get started. I wouldn't know even how to look into this, you know, so just the confidence level and the fact that it's not just one thing, you know, every client's going to be a little bit different. Everybody's going to want something different from you. You know, I've listened, I've just eaten up all of the content I could literally find in yours being quite a bit of that, especially early on about 
just relaxing into the process and making connections and seeing what people need and seeing if it's a good fit and adjusting it's needed. So, you know, it's not, you know, it's hard for people to step outside of their comfort zone and making those first connections with clients and getting on calls and touching base about what they need. But honestly, you know, through some of the content that I've, I've absorbed another nurse actually pod, you know, a topic about, you know, just bringing in an, an editor from the outside and had asked her, what is, what's most important for you? And, and that person was just like, I, I love people who are easy to work with. They don't have to be the smartest. They don't have to be the most experienced, but people who are kind and, and easy to work with and absorb, you know, what the needs are, you know, and the pain points of the client and truly listen, that's, that's the connection. And that's where you're going to find that success. I want to talk about capacity planning and capacity planning is interesting because most writers, we feel pretty good about like our planner and putting our deadlines in, but that's actually just scheduling. So scheduling is when is this thing due? And then capacity planning adds that layer of when can I do this? So when am I going to do it? And when am I going to not do it? How am I adding this deadline to my monthly planner and then making a plan to actually get the work done without overwhelming myself? And I think when you can figure that out or at least practice that skill and get much better at it, then you can start to see when you flip into periods of burnout when you put too much pressure on yourself and so writer's block pops up and you just can't even function. Those are things that capacity planning can help you with. So I have some awesome links. The father of capacity planning, at least in my book, is Ed Gandia. So I really strongly recommend, this is a free download from his site. This is the original capacity planner spreadsheet and this is where all the good ideas come from. So you would sign up for his list and be able to see that. I then took it and I added, because I'm a millennial, I added emojis and colors <laughs> and fun fonts. So this has been much more effective for me to be able to see what I'm doing and really make capacity planning kind of fun. But I think when you start to see how you're going to get stuff done that you've taken on, the stress and pressure comes off a little bit and then you can start to see burnout go away. And most importantly, for me at least, you can start to schedule in fun things, which some of us just don't do naturally, right? If it's not scheduled it and paid for, I'm probably going to skip it and try to get more work done. And that's part of that obsessive productivity that I've been working on and fighting. I'm going to walk through how I use mine. The first thing I realized, and the first thing that might hurt to come to terms with is I had been planning creative days for myself where I was trying to do six to eight hours of creative, productive client work. I don't know why, that's just something that seemed like a good idea. But once I realized that, I was able to say, oh, that's why I sign up for three or four deadlines in a week and then find myself completely overwhelmed, near tears on a Thursday, thinking, what did I do with the rest of my week? I should be able to do this. And all that pressure really builds up. And what I realized is I'm actually spending at least an hour a day on the phone and at least an hour a day in my inbox. So that's two hours of work time if you're working full time that are just gone in the daily maintenance of running a business or having a job or working with clients. And so once I started to say, wow, during the week, Mondays and Fridays, I try not to schedule calls, but Tuesday through Thursday, I definitely have one to two to three hours of phone calls. I bet I can't do six hours of client work. Like I can't, it's just not humanly possible for a brain made of meat to do that much in a day. And that was another lesson from 4,000 weeks. So I don't want to steal that one, but Putting that on the calendar and seeing, wow, when I look at the minimum of what I'm doing each day, I'm already at six hours. I'm already at five hours. So if I want to have lunch, if I want to get coffee with a friend and go into work later, all of this is going to add up. And I need to make, start making my capacity planner or my schedule look like I can actually do it. Like it's not a punishment for someone that I wouldn't subject them to. So marking down how much time do you want to spend in your inbox? How much time are you spending on calls? And then how much time is there reasonably for creative projects? And what I found is on a tough day, I can do two two hour Pomodoro sessions, which is the 50, 20, 50 power. I call it a power hour, 50, 20, 50, where you're doing focused work for 50 minutes. You have a timer, you take a break for 20 minutes, ideally not on a screen, but you walk around, you read a book, you do something human, and then come back and do another 50 minutes. And I realized I could get on a really good day, I can get two of those done, so four hours of creative work, and sometimes I can get one power hour done. So 50 minutes and then a break of about 10 minutes. And once I started chunking my day in that way, it became a lot easier to say, if I'm signing up for a deadline on the 9th, let's say I have a massive white paper and it's awesome. I actually need to work on that white paper like five times that week to get it done. And so suddenly I'm filling in my time. And if another deadline comes up, I can come to this week and say, wow, I could do that. 
if I want to punish myself, because I've already filled up all that time with white papers, so I really need to look at a deadline later in the week, or I really need to squish it in here. Or, let's be honest, sometimes we do just need to work on a weekend. I can plan to work on a weekend because I really need to get something done, something like that. But having that visibility into what you're doing and not overloading yourself is so powerful. So I'm going to share the links one more time just in case people joined us. The next thing that I did is I thought it would be helpful if I was bunching up all my deadlines on specific days, like it's just one day to remember. Now it's easier, right? But what I found is if you procrastinate, then you just have a massive amount of creative work to do under pressure that you don't get the best results and you don't deliver your best to your client. And so I started limiting myself to only two deadlines per day. And this could be small milestone deadlines, like the outline of something, the subject matter expert questions for something, the first draft, the final draft, client edits. There's only two really important things that I try to let myself schedule per day. And this was really hard for me as a recovering obsessive productivitist. Because in my mind, and that's why that advice of pick three things and anything else on the list is not going to get done. I really did not like that advice for the first 40 years of my life. But now I've realized like it may be possible to do more than three things in a day, but I don't think it's possible to do it and have work-life balance and feel at peace with your to-do list and feel like you've made enough progress that you can sit quietly and read a book in the evening without thinking about work. And I think that's where I want to be when it comes to if I'm going to say I'm not burned out, if I don't have writer's block, I'm going to say I'm relaxing in the evenings and I have hobbies that I don't beat myself up about. Those are things that I think we can expect if we're willing to put these processes in place and approach work a little strategically. So one of the things that is really important for if you're interviewing for a company, trying to get a job, or if you're trying to get a client, it's the exact same thing because it all stems from human psychology, is what too many people do is if you're writing your LinkedIn profile, if you're writing a resume, if you're writing, you know, whatever, often people start with, okay, so what has been my career path and what has been my story and what industries have I worked in? But really what's important is focus on where you're going next. Who are your next clients? What's your next job? And then build the way you market yourself backwards from that. So if you're like, if you want to become a, a technology writer, copywriter, you wouldn't necessarily talk about your past experience working in hospitality. Like maybe that was something that really defined who you are and built, you know, work ethic and all those things, but instead you would reposition your skills. And so that's what the glory formula is, is that we, when we use this, this process in my programs, it's not that we, you know, think about, oh, you know, Christine, tell me all the wonderful things that you've accomplished. No, it's like, Christine, where are you going? All right, we're going to build your story back from that. We're going to build a sales page, not a Wikipedia page of everything you've ever done. I love that sales page versus Wikipedia page. That's such a great reframe. Okay. Something my listeners also struggle with is the headline on LinkedIn. And I watched one of your YouTube videos from around 2018 about headline examples. And you suggested using this formula, which is their role their industry or their area of expertise and their unique value? And do you still suggest this approach? And what advice would you give listeners on how to create that compelling LinkedIn headline? I know that's a lot in one question. So let me just reiterate, is that the right approach for the headlines in today's day? Because LinkedIn is constantly shifting and what is the best way to create this headline? What's so important with the LinkedIn headline is make the headline reflect the value you add to the world, not necessarily your most recent role. So if you, uh, you said you worked in sales at, in, in a technology company, if you're trying to be a, a technology copywriter, your headline would not say sales in it, um, unless that was really relevant to the, the, the copy you were writing. You would brand yourself as technology copywriter, like claim it because, because the thing is, is your, your headline is the label of, okay, here's, here's the, the service I will add. Here is the value I will add to the world. And that's whether you're trying to be an employee or, or a freelancer. It's so confusing if you're saying, okay, yeah, I was this in the past, but I want to be something new. No, like, you know, make sure that you're labeling yourself properly. So really when you're making that transition full on, put those right keywords up there um, versus, you know, too often people will put something from their past that again is, is, is way too distracting.